will be our, our third week in a series where we're talking about the reality that there's a, a battle that's happening for all of us in our minds. And a couple of weeks ago, we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul says this, he says, I want you to actually take captive every thought that there's these lies that can become strongholds is the term that Paul uses is they can become strongholds in your life. And here's what I want you to do. Rather than be a victim of your thoughts, I want you to seek out the things that aren't true and make them captive and then force them to be obedient to Jesus. So the problem is most of the time these lies about us, our insufficiency, our worth, we end up being obedient to them. And Paul says, no, no, as a follower of Jesus, you get to control what happens in your mind. And then last week we looked at this idea from Romans chapter 12 that Paul says, I want you to be transformed and transformation isn't through religious practice. He says, I want you to be transformed and it begins up here, the renewing of your mind. And we talked about what that looks like. How do you renew your mind? And here's what I'd like to do this week, realizing that there's a real battle out there, realizing that there are strongholds that can be established in our life. I want us to turn our attention to the book of Philippians, Philippians uh, chapter one, we'll start at verse 12. And I want us to talk about how, how do you see God in the big picture, okay? What, how do we see God in the perspective? So there's every human being, like we have choices that we make and we have to be responsible for those, right? All of us, we've made choices. Some of them are good choices. Some of them are bad choices. One of the keys to being a healthy person is you take responsibility for your choices. But then there's a whole other set of things that happen in our life that we weren't responsible for. It's the circumstances of your life. And some of us, we've had a lot of positive circumstances. Some of us have had, like, it just feels like one after another painful circumstance. You're not, was anybody here in the room in charge of what family they would be born into? No, right? You don't have a say in that. Uh, tragedy, oftentimes, like, I didn't have a say in that. I didn't have a say in my health, how my biology would function. I didn't have a say in this travesty that happened in a business or, or a relationship. So I think one of the things that Paul's going to help with is he's going to help us to understand how can you have a perspective that doesn't just focus in on the pain. I actually, I have an email and um, I, I thought I'd read it, but I just, I want to quote it to you. It's from uh, one of my best friends here at the church. He's a neurologist and we were dialoguing and I was saying, hey, what are the patterns you see as a neurologist? And he said, well, one of the challenges is that painful situations create deeply embedded pathways in people's minds. And they probably have much more of an impact than positive situations, okay? So you can go through something tragic and it creates a neural pathway. There's a pattern in your mind and you can go through something wonderful, but it doesn't leave quite the same imprint, right? So he said, there's this process where we have to like experience renewal in our mind, especially people who've been through lots and lots of challenging circumstances in order to have a healthy, positive mind. Now, here's the setting. Paul is writing to his friends in one of the Roman cities called Philippi. Now, he's been there before. He helped them start a church. He uh, is proud of the church. It's actually, this is known as the epistle of joy because Paul just is effusive. It's the only letter that Paul writes to a church where he doesn't have to kind of like jump on them about something. <laughs> the whole letter is just like, hey, I'm so proud of you. You're doing great. I want to celebrate this. I want to celebrate that. But the setting, how Paul is writing this is interesting. He, he writes it from Rome. So here's part of Paul's perspective. I, I, I want to go back and look at a couple of scriptures that have to do with the Apostle Paul and him having a destiny that would end up in Rome. Now, Rome, uh, Rome is... It's the most powerful city in the world for a period of about 800 years, nearly 1,000 years. Rome is the epicenter of the Roman Empire. It's where the wealth is. It's where all the influences are. And early on, actually, we'll read this in the book of Acts, when Paul first has an encounter with Jesus. So he's this guy that's completely opposed to Jesus. He's actually trying to destroy the early church, the followers of Jesus. Jesus meets him face to face in the book of Acts knocks him backwards, he has this reorientation, and there's a man who's called to pray for Paul because after this encounter with Jesus, a bright light, he can't see. And this is what God tells Ananias, who's gonna come pray for Paul. He says, uh, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man, speaking of Paul, 
is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles, that's the non-Jewish world, and their kings. That's what I want you to notice. From the very inception of Paul being this uniquely called person, you don't find anyone else in the New Testament who has this. That Paul is going to speak to the, gen, the non-Jewish world and their kings. This is going to be a guy who has the capacity to sit down, the intellectual capacity, the cultural adapt, uh, adapt, adaptability to be able to speak to even kings and to the people of Israel. So at the very beginning, Paul knows, one day I'm going to end up in Rome. He's just a good Jewish boy. How would that ever happen? We'll read a little bit later, and you can find actually several instances of this. Um, after all this had happened, this is Acts 19, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. And after having been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. So Paul's had this, this idea that, to be in the heart of the Roman Empire. He's been dealing with Roman culture all his life. But someday, the chance to be in Rome, the chance to influence the influencers, the chance to establish and plant a church in the world's most influential and powerful cities. Now, Paul eventually makes it to Rome. But it's not quite what he thought it would be. Okay? I want to show you a picture. This is historically the very prison where Paul is kept. He ends up in prison for two years with the Jewish leaders. And then he ends up in the Marmertime prison. If you actually could read this in Latin, it says the home of both Peter and Paul. And this is, was like their maximum security prison. Paul has to eventually, to avoid being executed, because he's a Roman citizen, he pleads his case to Caesar. Okay, now, the problem is Caesar, who's in Rome, isn't terribly interested in sitting down hearing like little disputes and squabbles. So for two years, Paul lives, we really believe this is it. I don't know if you can tell, but there's a hole up here. This is how you entered in. There's a prison cell below and it's, it's underground. So this is not a place that you escape. This isn't a place, I mean, it's, it's lit right now because now you can go and visit. You can pay 20 bucks and go down and see that. Um, but it is a dark, dank, cold brutal place and Paul has a new Roman guard who every eight hours comes and sits with him and is chained to him. It's part of the incarceration just to make sure that none of the emperor's prisoners could ever escape. You're in this hole which you can't escape from and you're chained up to a Roman guard. A new one comes every eight hours. So anybody kind of think Italy and Rome is a little bit romantic? Like you want to go there sometime, eat the food? This is Paul's visit to Rome. I'm called to talk to kings. I've made strategic choices to one day get to Rome. And here I am in Rome. And I'm chained up. And the only people I get to talk to are the Roman guards for two years. Now, one of the books that he writes from this prison cell. He's actually gonna write a number of books from that prison cell. We call them the prison epistles or letters, the prison letters. One of the books that he writes is the book of Philippians. Let's read together our main text as Paul gives his perspective on what has happened in his life, these circumstances he had no control over. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, okay, this is, this is the circumstances in life. These are the things I didn't have much control over. What has happened to you? Okay, well, all of us have had things happen to, me, to us. What has happened to me, here's the key word, has actually. Because you could look at this. I mean, I probably would have written, and maybe you, like instead of the NIV, I would have wrote, written the NWV, the New Winers version. Anybody write that? What's happened to me is terrible. I always wanted to go to Rome. I thought I was going to talk to Caesar. Instead, I'm in this stinking prison. It's been four years under the Jews. Now I'm in a new prison cell. This is the worst thing ever. This is not what I signed up for. Like, why won't God set me free? It's not what he says. What has happened to me has actually served to advance the good news, the gospel. As a result, so as a result of what has happened to me, my imprisonment 
and Caesar not even being interested in hearing my case, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard. Now, it's easy for us to skip this over. So Paul is actually in very close proximity to the palace where the emperor is. And so who guards the emperor's prisoners? The palace guard. So these are the most highly trained, some of the most deadly men on the face of the planet. And I'm sure they weren't really excited about having a job, you know, guarding a Jewish teacher. This is the whole palace guard, all the people that are involved in the key strategic force that protects Caesar, the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ, for the promised one. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters, he's talking about the church that's already existent in Rome, the Christians, most of the brothers and sisters, not all, but most, have become confident in the Lord. There was a sense of fear and they were, you live in a place like Rome, you're afraid if I oppose the empire, what would happen? Now, because I've been in prison, they become all the more confident and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear perspective on what happens to you and how is God working in the midst of it. So like there are a million different worldviews on things. So you, like the word fate, there are major word, world religions that say, hey, it's just your fate. There's like some destiny out there. Um, sometimes we use the word luck, like you have good luck, you have bad luck. Okay. Um, some people would say it's just the will of God, that God's in control of everything all the time. Uh, it's the will of Allah, would be the Muslim world. Paul says, hey, there's a different way of looking at what happens to you. What if there's a God who is working through all the circumstances? Not that he caused every bad thing to happen, but there are things that happen. And God, what if he could capitalize? What if he could make something good out of really tough circumstances? And what if... What if I could begin to have his perspective on life? I'm gonna give you a few points for having the godly perspective, for being able to see the meta narrative of God's work in our lives. Number one, please know this. My story won't make sense unless I know the author of life. Okay, so the story that you're in now, the story that all of us are in, there's some chapters that are probably beautiful and there's chapters that are tragic. But my story will never completely make sense to me unless I know the author of life, the one who is writing the script. Unless I understand that there is this God who isn't surprised by anything, who allows us, this is, this is like, there's tension here. He allows us to make free choices and yet knows everything, right? Yeah, my story just will never make sense. Let, let me give you an example. I'm going to give you an example of someone that some of you will know who I'm talking about. This young man, he's born into a fairly dysfunctional family. There's favoritism. There's multiple marriages. There's a lot of dysfunction in his home. He has some unique giftings and abilities. He just seems to be a leader, a born leader. And unfortunately for him, his father looks at him and just says, you're my prized possession. So all of his brothers, 11 brothers, they feel betrayed, they feel rejected, and, and what, they begin to hate their brother. So one day they're all out working. They're an agrarian family. They're out working, and his brothers are so fed up with him. They think he's arrogant. They beat him, physical violence. They throw him into an abandoned cistern. And then they happen to see some people who are involved in human trafficking coming by. And they say this, let's sell him. Let's sell him into a life of servitude. So they sell their brother into a life of servitude. They go home to their parents, to their dad, and they say, hey, we're so sorry. Here's my brother's jacket, and it's covered in blood. They, cover, they, they actually falsify it. They put a goat's blood on it. They say he was killed. They're so sorry. Dad's crushed. So now you have this young man who's from this dysfunctional family who's been physically abused, who has now been sold into slavery. He ends up in another land as a foreigner, and he's a, he's a servant. He, he's, 
Like he has no freedom, and he does the best he can while he's there, but he's accused of a crime that he actually doesn't do. He actually makes the right choice, but he's accused of a crime, so he's sent into prison. And he's, he's in prison. This is about a decade-long process. He's in prison for this long period of time. He's betrayed by friends. It just seems like nothing, nothing, nothing goes this man's way. But one day, the king has a disturbing dream, and somebody remembers this guy and says, hey, this guy. He, 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 he like knows how to hear from God. He ends up pleasing the king, helping him to understand things. He comes into a place of power. His name's Joseph. Okay, you can read about his story in the book of Genesis. He comes to a place of power where he's like second to the king of Egypt. Well, there's a famine in his homeland and it's been decades since he's seen anybody from his family and his brothers come, but they don't recognize him. He's dressed like an Egyptian. It's been years and years. And he looks at his brothers and he's just overwhelmed with emotion. There's pain there. There's hope there. He wonders if his dad's still alive. And his brothers find out, like, this is the brother that we beat. This is the brother that we sold into slavery. They're terrified for their lives. And this is what Joseph says to them. This is this idea of knowing the author of life. In Genesis, we read this. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because here's the reason. Here's the reason that all of that happened to me. It was because it, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Wait a minute. Did Joseph use, use the word sent? I, I was beaten. I was betrayed by my family. And now, years later, he goes, actually, now I see what was happening. I know the author of life. God sent me to Egypt. You thought you beat me. You thought you sold me into slavery. You thought that you took care of me once and for all. But God was working in the midst of it. God sent me for two years now. There has been a famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and no reaping but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. And Joseph does exactly that. He saves the lives of his family and of the Jewish people. How do you get to the place? Because wouldn't, wouldn't we all love that? Like I get to the place where I realize all the painful, difficult things that have happened in my life. Where, where's the author of life? What is he doing where I realize you sold me, but he sent me? It was painful what happened to Joseph because he knows that he serves a God who is creating a story and narrative that's bigger than any one circumstance. He can even look at his brothers. They, they don't repent. They're not sorry. He says, I get that there was a much bigger thing happening and all of that was uncomfortable. But God knew what he was doing and here I am at this moment. And along the way, I learned so many strategic and important lessons. So I think the question is always, what will my filter be as I look at the circumstances of life? Have you ever wondered like how two people can have pretty much the exact same experience and they come away with completely different conclusions? I was thinking about this, there were some years ago, I, I made the worst hire of my life. Like I still scratch my head, like why in the world did I hire this person? Like things were terrible. I went into their annual review and it, like I felt like it was so brutal and I thought if I had that review, I would quit. And so I set up a, a meeting the next day to meet with this person to see like how they were doing after that review. Cause it was like, it was challenging. And uh, I said, hey, how are you doing today? Great, thanks for all the encouragement. I was like, there was no encouragement in that review. None whatsoever. Like we were in the same meeting. You can have different perspectives. Well, I think he had like rosy lenses on, you know, like everything. It's not as bad as it could be, right? Well, I gotta wonder like, how, what am I looking at? What do I see? Do, do I have this perspective that in the midst of the days when I'm in prison, the, the midst of the day when I'm betrayed, when it's the most painful, I still believe that the author of life is writing a story. 
And it's a story, I don't know the ending. That's the problem. When you're in the middle of it, you do not know the ending. But Paul from his prison cell says, listen, man, I'm in prison. You know what? Actually, it's turned out for the good. Actually, God's doing things. I'm totally incapacitated. I'm chained to a Roman guard. But can you see Paul? Like every eight hours, he's like, (laughs) a new Roman guard. Come on in, come on in. We're going to spend eight hours together. (laughs) And guess what? I have some things to talk to you about. What would it be like to be chained to the Apostle Paul for eight hours? He says, the whole palace guard, like every one of them, they're all like, no, 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 no. I'm not taking that ship. New guy, you're going with the Paul guy because he's going to talk to you about some guy named Jesus for eight straight hours. He goes, right now, the whole palace guard, everybody knows what I believe and like my perspective on life. I'm not like weeping in my cell. I believe that God is writing a story. I don't know what the end of it is, but I know that right now, God's in the midst of this moment. He is in the midst of this moment. If I don't know the author of life, if I don't believe that he is constantly writing a story, I'll get stuck in the valleys. The travesties and the pains will overwhelm me. Here's point number two. Well, I focus on my expectations or God's activities, okay? My expectations. Um, I have been told that I have high expectations. I don't think I do, but apparently I do. I have high expectations for myself and for others. And so I, I find myself, like, I, I can foresee, like, this is how this meeting is going to go. This is how this uh, weekend should go. And it never goes quite like I want it to. And I focus a lot on my expectations. And then you feel a little disappointed. Like, that's, that's not what I wanted. Or can I focus on God's activity? Here's a brilliant question to ask. You learn this from Joseph. You learn this from Paul. In the midst of all the difficulty, what is God doing? What's he up to? So Paul easily could have focused on his expectations. I thought I'd come to Rome. I thought I would stand before the emperor of Rome. I thought I would have a chance to influence a nation, but instead, here I am. So Paul refuses to focus on the chains. He refuses to focus on that little circular prison underground that he's in. He refuses to focus on the poor food, the cold, damp conditions. They didn't meet his expectations, I guarantee you. Instead, he's looking for what God is doing. What, what is God's activity? Here's God's activity. Bosses, the whole palace guard knows. And by the way, I don't know exactly how this happens, but there were a lot of followers of Jesus in Rome who were terrified, but somehow they're seeing what I'm going through and they're seeing that I still have courage and that I believe the author of life is writing things that I don't even know what they are. And now most of the believers in Rome have become more emboldened and they've become stronger. And rather than hiding, rather than living in a defensive posture, they're engaging the city of Rome. Paul can't engage the city of Rome, but here's what he sees. But the people that I influence are engaging the city of Rome. Little does Paul know at this point, he's regularly producing letters. This is one of the letters that he produces while he's in that prison. Do you think Paul would have ever thought that 2,000 years later, a group of people in an area of the world they didn't know existed would be sitting down reading his words? He doesn't focus on his broken expectations. He focuses on God's activity. I can't help but think of another ancient Old Testament story. The people of Israel have been wandering in the desert for 40 years. They've, for 40 years. They've, they, God keeps saying, I've got a land for you. I've got a home for you. They've been living as a nomadic tribe. They come to the edge, they, um, get to, they send 12 spies. Okay, we'll have 12 people go in, and what happens? Well, they all see the same things. There, there's two, two out of 12, okay, two. And they're the only two whose names are even gonna be familiar to you. Caleb and Joshua. They tour through the land. And when they get back, this is, this is what the 10 say. The 10 say this, they say, um, the land devours people. 
This promised land, it doesn't meet our expectations. When we were leaving Egypt, we were told there would be a promised land. It was gonna have like milk and honey, all these wonderful things. But he said, this land, what, what does that even mean? The land is like, ah, ah, right? The land of ours people. And they say this, the people there are large and numerous and we look like grasshoppers in their eyes. I guarantee you that no one, none of the Canaanites looked at them and said, you look to me like a grasshopper. <laughs> none of them said that. They just had this sense of intimidation. We thought the promised land was gonna be open. We thought we'd just like come in and there wouldn't be anybody occupying it. But there's two people, Joshua and Caleb, who go like, what? We all had the same experience. We all saw the same thing. They all agreed that the land is fruitful. They, all, they came back with fruit to show everybody. But Caleb and Joshua, what do they say? They say, oh, the land is a good place and God has given it into our hands. Their expectations weren't met either, but they just knew that God's activity was at work. But the majority, and I wonder if this isn't true in our culture today, the majority of people are gonna see it didn't meet my expectations. To be a Caleb, to be a Joshua means, that, hey, I look beyond my expectations and I see God's hand at work. Here's the third and final point. Look for opportunities rather than liabilities, okay? Look for opportunities rather than liabilities. Um, liabilities, everything that doesn't work, okay? Everything that, this, this, I, this isn't what I expected. This, this is a deficit in my life. Here's the thing is you gotta look for the opportunity. So Paul's saying, hey, I got an opportunity with the palace guards. I've got an opportunity to encourage and strengthen the believers here in Rome. I've got opportunities. So, um, I, I never wanted to talk about this too much because I, I never wanted it to be like a, a bemoaning woe is us thing. But, you know, a year and a half ago when COVID hit, do you know what that was like for like churches and pastors? And for, for thousands of years, we've been meeting together once a week and all of a sudden you can't, right? Man, I could feel it. Like, um, like we're trying to like figure out, can we record services? What is gonna happen? Like, we, we have no idea. And I am, I'm sitting probably about right where you are with a hat on. I'm in here and I'm praying and I'm just like, God, what is happening? Like, is this the end of church as we know it? Or is everything gonna fall apart? And I just, just as clear as day, I heard the Lord remind me of this. this is, he just said this, and this is a quote that he made. I will build my church and it's a church that the gates of hell won't be able to stand against. And I'm like, okay, okay. So all I was thinking about was all the liabilities. We can't meet together. Um, like things like gonna be, can I pay our staff? Will anybody ever come back? Do we sell the building? You know, you're just kind of freaking out, right? And I just felt like the Lord said, hey, 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 hey. I've been building my church for 2000 years. And guess what? I built it through like the plague. And I built it through every horrific thing that has happened in the history of humanity. And you know what? I'm not going to quit building my church right now. And so I got up from that. And a day later, we had a staff meeting. And I just could walk into the staff meeting. I go, guys, let's not quit. Let's not think about all the, all the liabilities. I said, let's think about the opportunities. Like, what are the opportunities? And the people in the staff meeting keep going, seating capacity no longer matters. The size of our parking lot no longer matters. Yeah, yeah, right, what else? Geography no longer matters. We can do church online. That's when a lot of you guys started joining us. It's like, okay, let's quit thinking about church, just people who can make it to the Billings area. Let's think about churches. Man, this can go anywhere in the globe. And like, you just see this, like the hope, we're all like, God's gonna build this church. If we have to wear masks for the next 40 years and can't meet in public, like, what, is like God gonna give up? God say like, oh, shoot, COVID. I didn't think about that one, right? God's totally in line with all that's happening. So I just would encourage you. I've been trying to put this practice in my life. When something looks like it's just a liability, what's the opportunity? Okay, God, all right, I'm shaking. I'm in prison. Okay, I got rock all around me. There's a little hole when they drop me food. It's cold, it's wet. What are the opportunities? Like. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? If you look for God's goodness, you'll see it. You notice you always find what you're looking for. 
right? If, I, if I'm looking with critical eyes, I'll see plenty of things to be critical for. If I look with an eye of hope and faith, what's going to happen? I'll see those things. God will open my eyes to be able to see those exact same things. I want to end with just a, a couple of questions. Number one, do I know the author of life? Do, do I know the author? Because your life, I mean, some of you, you're really young and like the story's just beginning and some of us, you have a, a beautiful first chapter and like you're just not sure what the rest is going to be. Some of us, we've been around a little while and we got a lot of chapters accumulated. We don't know what the end is like. Here's the thing that just can put, if you were a follower of Jesus, see, this is key and I know many of you would be spiritually unresolved. I think one of the most beautiful things about being surrendered to Jesus, being a, a, a follower of Jesus is I just suddenly have this perspective that there is the author of life who created, you read about that in Genesis, and still creates. He's writing your story. You might be in a chapter right now where you're like, this is terrible. The diagnosis from the doctor, the broken heart, whatever it might be. I just, I guarantee you, that is not the end of the book. There is a God who makes all things work together for the good, for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Do I know the author? Do I believe that he is ultimately in control of writing the script? The second question. Am I okay with altering my expectations and instead looking for God's activity, right? Um, it just breaks my heart. I, I bet every week I have a conversation with somebody who, it's something like this, like, I used to have hope in God. I, maybe I, I used to be engaged, I used to, but such and such happened to me, and it's been so painful that I've just kind of given up on God because something negative and difficult happened in their life, and I get that. Like, I, I can identify with some of that pain, but because God didn't meet my expectation, I, I, I wish I could tell you that this book said it'd be so great hey once you give your life to Jesus everything will be awesome <laughs> right you'll have no more pain you'll make no more mistakes nobody will ever betray you life is going to just be great it doesn't say that I mean one of the guys who wrote it writes from a prison cell you know what the end of his story is he's going to go before Caesar he's going to be executed. But in the midst of it, he says, that's not the end I would have written. If you're going to write a movie of your life, would it be, and I went before and they killed me. He says, I, God's still working. Because even his physical death, this is what Paul believed, that's not the end of my story. That's the end of chapter one. <laughs> that was me physically alive on planet earth. And now I've got eternity with God. Third question would be this. Where are the opportunities? Um, can you just lift, lift your head, right? When painful things happen, I just look at my immediate surroundings, shake the chains, the rattles, the same old guards time after time. Lift my head and say, okay, God, if you're a God who can do anything, I'm looking for opportunities. If I'm going to be stuck in this prison, if I'm going to be stuck eating this food, if this, if this is what you've got for me, God, I'm okay. I just trust. I believe that there are opportunities for me to thrive. There are opportunities for me to serve. With this broken heart, right, I can serve you. With this rough financial reality I find myself in. It's not everything. Like I can serve you even though I'm broke, even though I'm divorced, God. It's not the end of my story. I believe that there are opportunities for me to follow you, to walk with you, to influence other people. Where are the opportunities? Because God's always gonna bring a new opportunity. It may not be what I expected, but it's gonna be divine because it came from him.